Right, so I want to mention four things, if that's OK. So um, there's an awful lot in uh, the report, so hopefully people have managed to to read it cover to cover. So um, the salient points for me uh, pertinent, given both opportunity and risk, uh, are firstly the vacancy management plan. So we've debated this at detail, in detail previously and in other committees, um, but hopefully the narrative provides further assurance that we are onto it, particularly in terms of some uh, key areas of, of vacancy deficit, uh, those being qualified in nursing and medics. So we've got a structure in place to um, monitor, to assure ourselves that these deliverables are being achieved. We have non-recurrent monies this year. We're fortunate to have non-recurrent monies this year to be able to aid those uh, individual actions um, and so it's vital that we use this period to um, both bolster recruitment and to um, ensure that the environment is such that we maximise retention. So, so that's a vital piece of work that is ongoing and will continue through to the end of the year in terms of those specific actions. Uh, linked to that are a few other points that you'll see um, towards the start of, of the document. Um, particularly in relation to things such as our coaching programme. So as well as the quite specific pointed actions, of course, the wider cultural aspects of the organisation are key, particularly to retention. So things like investment in coaching is absolutely vital, hence the inclusion of the narrative within uh, the report. Um, Thirdly, I'll maybe go external and just mention two, two points. So I think, David, you alluded a moment ago to recent announcements around funding. I mean, it's great in that clearly a significant amount of additional investment, circa, I think it's 12 or 13 million pounds a year on average for the next three years, is destined for health and social care to be raised through largely through a national insurance increase. Um, that's great news, of course. Key is to ensure that we use uh, that funding well. And within that, of course, key is to ensure that we have the staff to be able to employ to in turn spend the money, uh, which goes full circle to the first conversation. Um, I don't necessarily know that it will have a massive impact on mental health, which of course already has a stream of funding coming its way. But given the nature of the improvements that we're seeing in systems across the country, health and social care systems, um, we are closer, more closely than ever being uh, linked through to other aspects of the system. So what benefits one aspect of the system substantially, I'm sure will in part also benefit other aspects of the system. And of course, it shouldn't be forgotten that we also provide general practice, physical health services, in uh, Stoke-on-Trent. So, um, uh, really good news. Uh, the detail is to be seen over coming days and weeks, but I think in principle it's a, a fantastic opportunity for the NHS to mitigate some of the future risks that we have and to manage some of the existing issues, particularly in terms of waiting lists that we also have. Uh, the final point I'll mention is around the system development programme. That's the move towards becoming a full ICS uh, by the 1st of April 2022. A variety of work uh, streams continue to um, move on at pace. We are leading the OD and place aspects of that, as well as having oversight, of course, of the mental health programme, which I've already, already mentioned. Um, OD being vital to all of this and ensuring that we have conversations in the right order, uh, form following functions, so to debate and discuss uh, OD aspects through to form, sorry, through to function, and then through finally to form, which we are making sure we do through the various um, work stream and work group activities that we've got. So a huge amount of work to do, of course, including the very practical points around appointing to the ICS board uh, and the CEO appointment is currently out to market. Uh, it went out at the start of this month and that CEO, uh, CEO appointments to all of the ICSs across the country, which I think from memory there are 41. So all of those appointments are happening in parallel as we speak. So lots to do uh, and it's vital that we involve you all, but also of course other stakeholders in the system as we build and develop 
uh, the various infrastructure that uh, will become ultimately the uh, the final ICS. I think I'll leave it there, David, as I say, really, really large report um, and I've pulled four things out. I'm happy to take questions on any aspects. That That's great. Thanks very much. Um, Joan. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks for the report, Peter. You're right, it, it's it's hugely um, well detailed and, the, and there's, a, there's a lot in it. And uh, I just really wanted to flag up one thing and, and ask another question on something separate, if I may, Chair. And um, the first one was to thank you for including um, the sustainability and the um, call for action on the net zero um, in your chief executive's report. And I think that it's really important that the work that our trust does, which is largely going through um, FNR, and we had the detailed paper at our meeting last week, uh, that that is reflected and embedded within the whole work of the trust. And I just wanted to say that um, I'm, I'm pleased that that work is going forward. I'm pleased that there's the call out for ambassadors and people to be involved in that. And I think that over the medium and the longer term, um, the way in which we respond and the ambition that we have to embed both the zero carbon and the nature recovery aspects into our um, workload will actually enhance local resilience. And it will be very much linked to the ongoing work of the ICS. So just as this is embedded within our framework and forward work, it also has to be embedded in the work of the ICS. So it's just good that we're taking the lead on that. And I just wanted to encourage as many staff and people as possible in all aspects of our trust, um, users, everybody, service users, to actually get on board with this agenda. That was my comment. Um, and my question is, um, on a completely separate matter, um, the issue about the mental health funding and um, the fact that it's non-recurrent monies for this year. And we're all, aren't we, very familiar with the pressures on other parts of the system, particularly UHNM. And um, the headline this morning in the local newspaper is that there are 7,000 people waiting um, post-COVID for action. And it was really just to ask you, both in, um, well, more so with your science systems work, what kind of principles we're using to ensure that that focus on mental health doesn't just get submerged within the wider pressures that there are on the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, acknowledging the first point, Joan, really important and, uh, you know, the fact that sustainability is one of our four uh, key strategic themes, I think, sort of lends itself to, to that important uh, point. On the second point, we just need to perhaps be careful to uh, not conflate two points. So the uh, mental health investment standard and funds that flow uh, to achieve the mental health long-term plan are absolutely ring-fenced, are audited uh, up to their eyeballs, and we absolutely ensure as a system regionally and nationally that that is dedicated funds to support the various goals within uh, the mental health long-term plan so so that is their separate discrete and of course adds capacity um as long as we can get the workforce and train and develop the workforce it adds capacity to mental health services over time to ensure that we can mitigate increasing demand both uh, here and now and going forward so so that is happening and that has been in my view um over and above over recent years funds that have flown recurrently into other aspects of the nhs uh, and the point being i suppose critically that that is recurrent monies so so that is ring fence that is clear and present and that is a massive benefit. There is this additional allocation, I've got in my head, five uh, billion uh, up front to support the reduction of waiting lists. Um, I suspect that the priority for that specific cohort of money will be um, elective uh, backlogs, predominantly through acute organisations. Uh, there are massive waiting lists out there, both locally and nationally. That is simply the reality, the product of uh, the reality of COVID. Uh, it is as simple as that. Uh, and it's going to take a massive effort to mitigate that. 
um, if there is funding and the need to fund uh, over and above the mental health long term plan mental health backlogs, then clearly we will need to have a conversation with the system to support that. My hope and ambition is that the mental health funding that is already dedicated to uh, to to ourselves in the system will be sufficient to mitigate risk. But of course, if that isn't the case, I'll be the first one to shout at system level uh, to request additional funding to, to mitigate and manage backlogs. So I, I think we're in a really good place. I, I don't see there being an issue other than the fundamental point about workforce, which is impacting on us all. OK, thank you. Um, any other questions for, for, for Peter? Uh, Russell? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, Peter, thanks for the report and uh, the section on the vacancy management plan um, looks really positive. Um, but my question is, is there any data, any local or regional or national data that we've got on vacancies so that we can benchmark ourselves? Um, we keep hearing that it, this is a challenge nationally, uh, and I'm absolutely sure it is, but it would be really helpful just to have some additional data to understand how we're benchmarking. Mm. So, so there is an NHS benchmarking uh, organisation that, um, not surprisingly, has concentrated recently heavily on the impact on operational services associated with COVID, uh, which in itself is really helpful uh, to understand. Um, I'm sure that there's a, if you like, a back office equivalent of that. So a, a broader set of KPIs that go beyond operations that um, the NHS benchmarking organisation uh, collate. So I will have a conversation with colleagues. It might be that uh, Vicky and the performance team, Eric and uh, of course Shajida, have access to, to some of that information and then we'll bring that back through an appropriate committee. In fact, just to speed things up, it might be wise once we've got hold of it just to send it round the board um, for, for, for context. Yeah. Thanks Peter. Thank you. Sorry, I've got my hand up. I, I wanted to add to that, if I may, Peter. Can, can you see yeah. my hand up? I'm sorry. <laughs> go on, go on. Uh, I was just going to share with you, um, Russell, that um, what we are doing in the system, in addition to the national work, we're required to complete some returns for NHS provider. And we're currently in the process of developing a system dashboard. Um, I can share with you some key headlines. So we're at the very early uh, conception of developing these metrics, but the vacancy rate for the system is currently at 10.16%. Yeah. The sickness absence rate for the system is currently at 4.83%, and the turnover rate is currently at 10.24%. And I think the reference period for that was as at the end of July. So you, you may find that helpful in terms of the fact that, you know, as well as nationally, we are looking at developing a suite of system metrics to give us a um, a, a stronger platform, as it were, in supporting us to workforce plan better, in particular around our vacancy and turnover from a mental health workforce perspective. Thanks, Eugenia. That, that's really helpful, and it, and it sounds like that's a great start. And, and we can pick the, pick up the implications of that in the in the in the people committee. I think we've lost the chairman. Um, sorry, Peter. Um, uh, Patrick, just before you um, speak, Patrick, just to um, let people know, we have asked for this information at the People Committee already, uh, and also to see the uh, vacancy management plan. And I think probably it would be helpful if we perhaps looked at it in the committee and put, pulled those strings together and then came back to the board rather than seeing uh, stuff in isolation. Uh, so if we can perhaps take it forward that way, I think it would be really helpful. Uh, Patrick. It's just a comment on the on the the uh, figures. The the I, I read something recently. I can't remember the source, but I suspect it's the Health Service Journal. But the figure that was given nationally for for standard vacancy or what what they called the, the sort of vacancies generally in mental health was fourteen percent, but the figures were higher, and I think it might have been as up as far as twenty percent in young people's services. But I don't know what the source of that information, what the, what the source of those figures is. I don't know if anybody's seen anything similar. Uh, yeah. So that, that 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 might be helpful, don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's useful, Patrick. And it is important that we compare ourselves to our cohort, our group, because, of course, mental health, as I mentioned to a pre, you know, response to a previous question, 
we are unique as a sector having received the mental health investment monies over recent years. So our growth in establishment, which is a positive story on the face of it, our growth in establishment is unique across the NHS because of that investment level. But of course, that in turn creates the risk associated with vacancy levels increasing. So it, the system stuff is really important, I, I think, to provide appropriate context national comparisons across our sector mental health are, are of equal importance which as i say i'm sure we can get hold of and bring through the people committee so yeah that's helpful patrick okay i haven't got sorry about my distractions i haven't got any other hands up at the moment so does that mean we can move on i think it probably does 